a D6 church is all about helping families navigate the spiritual waters of reaching the next generation. And that is who we are. That is what we are about. And God has given us a clear mandate in Deuteronomy 6. So as you go throughout this morning, as maybe you take notes in your worship guide, or you think about your role and your opportunity as the faith family here at Bacon, I want you to think about becoming a D6 church. I, I have a desire, and it's a, it's a future desire, it's a process. And that is for us to be a church that is full of biblical mentors. Now what that is, is people who understand Scripture, not just have a head knowledge of it, but have imparted the truth of Scripture into their hearts and lives and now are applying it in everything that they do. Whether it is as a grandparent, as a retiree, as whether you continue to work in, in full-time career, as you serve your families, it's a matter of being able to mentor the next generation. Listen, schools and businesses have tapped into this concept for a number of years. The discipline that is missing in churches today is mentoring the next generation in the truth of the gospel. And when we become a church that is full of people who understand their role as a biblical mentor, to not just impart the knowledge of truth, but who impart and transform lives with the knowledge of truth that they have through grace. And so a D6 church is what we are looking at. And, and the process begins today as hopefully we can become a, an intergenerational church that unchurched people love to come to. And that's when you know that you're reaching the next generation. When people who have no relationship with Jesus Christ find their way to Bacon Heights because Bacon Heights left this building and went and found them. Friends, let me share something with you. And this is why it is so important. George Barna did a, a study years ago. And I want to give you a, a statistic. I'm not a big numbers guy, but this is one that will blow your mind. I want you to listen closely. Barna's research found this. Of the 51 million children under the age of 18 who live in the United States, more than 41 million of them do not know Jesus Christ as their Savior. Which suggests this. There are basic, unmet spiritual needs that parents are overlooking. This is one of, if not the most significant fertile mission field in the entire world. Yet the very people who claim responsibility for the spiritual growth of their children are doing little beyond dropping them off at church. And churches are allowing them to continue this lack of discipleship by simply saying, bring them to us and we will teach them. Folks, that is a backwards process of discipleship. And it has been proven if only 10 million of the 51 million children in this world have come to know Jesus as their Savior, then we have done something wrong over the past years. And that is, we have not equipped families to be the biblical mentors and the pastors and the children pastors in their homes. We have simply just allowed them to come and drop their children off into the loving care of a wonderful Sunday school worker or volunteer. But why would we ever think that they would grow more by simply coming to church? Now listen, Deuteronomy 6 is a pivotal passage in changing our trajectory as a church. Let's read it together. Deuteronomy 6, beginning in verse 4. We're going to read verses 4 through 9, and then we'll unpack this a little bit more. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. For these words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart. 
And you shall teach them diligently to your sons and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way, and when you rise and when you lie down. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontals on your forehead. And you shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Now, I believe Moses to be the author of Deuteronomy. There are a lot of theologians that could go into a great debate as to who might be other than Moses as the writer of this great book. But I believe and have come to you saying Moses is writing to the people of Israel and he has this last sermon, if you will, before they enter into the promised land. They make their way to the Jordan River and now he says, I want to tell you something before we cross over. You see, Deuteronomy is what could be described as a pivot book. It's a book that has the ability to look back into the past and to look back at what God has done, but then also to look forward to the promises that God has made to them. We are at a pivot point in the history of our church. Bacon Heights stands at the edge of the Jordan River. And we can look back over the 47 and nearly 48 year history of our church and we can see how God has blessed and how God has led and how God has moved. But the day has come for us to look forward to the promises that God has made that he intends to fulfill. And so Moses having given the Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter 20, and then again in Deuteronomy chapter 5, you'll find both of those in Scripture. He now gives what we could describe to you as the Deuteronomic Code. And verse 4 is so important because he says this Shema passage, still very imperative to the Jewish faith today, when he says they would wear them as frontals on their foreheads and bind them on their arms, they would wear what's called little boxes that are called phylacteries. And they would actually wrap them, or they do even still today, they, they bind them on their foreheads and, and on their arms. And a number of scriptures can be found in there, in this little box. But one of those is verse 4, the Shema passage. Hear, O Israel, listen closely. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. could also be described to us as Yahweh our God. Yahweh is one. So he reminds them of who they serve and what they are about. And then he pivots very quickly. Look again at verse 5. You shall love the Lord your God. With all your heart, soul, and mind. Here's the first thing. For us to become a D6 church, it starts with you. Look at what Moses says. It's the very first word of verse 5. You. He doesn't say church. He doesn't say mom and dad. He doesn't say parents. He doesn't say y'all. He says, you, you love God with the totality of your being. Everything within you, everything that identifies you, you love God. And listen, you cannot give what you do not have. And if you do not have the love of God, that permeates your entire being, how are we ever going to impress upon the next generation the love of Jesus Christ? If it does not ooze out of you of what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, we will never reach the next generation. We will never go beyond moms and dads and grandparents alike dropping their kids off at church and then expecting them one hour or a week to come to faith in Jesus Christ. We have really got this mixed up. To be a D6 church, it starts with you. And as you think about you 
and your relationship with God and your love for Jesus Christ and your investment in the kingdom of God through the family of Bacon Heights, you have to understand clearly that the legacy begins with you. And it begins with me. And Moses says, you express that by loving God. Now, this is not a love that we would have for football or a love that we would have for Mexican food or a love for our favorite team. No, no, this is a love that surpasses all things. This is a love that goes beyond just a passion. It is a lifestyle. It is a purpose. And it has deep meaning. Mark Batterson wrote a book called All In. You may have read that book. And I want to share with you a, a quote that Mark says about what it means to be all in. What it means to love God with everything you have. All of who you are. Mark says this. It, all in means the dethroning of yourself. And the enthroning of Jesus Christ. It is the complete devastation of self-interest, giving God veto power. It is surrendering, surrendering all of you to all of Him. The simple recognition that every second of time, every ounce of energy, every penny of money is a gift from God and for God and we must deepen our love for Jesus with a childlike trust in the Heavenly Father and a blind obedience to the Holy Spirit. And so the question that you have to answer, because it begins with you, is if you want Bacon Heights to become a D6 church, are you willing to follow with blind obedience to the Holy Spirit. Are you willing to say, Lord, whatever it is, I'm all in. You see, that's what changes the church. When a new legacy is birthed out of you and your love for God, to be in the next generation's memories we have to be in their lives today if you want to be in the memories of your children and your grandchildren you have to be in their lives today and the same is true as we seek to minister and to love the next generation of faith in Christ Jesus, the next generation of Bacon Heights. That means we have to dethrone ourselves. Luke would say that we would die to ourselves. Take up our cross daily and follow Him. And see, sometimes following you don't have all the details. It's not clearly laid out on the path. But a blind obedience and a trust of the Holy Spirit of where He leads, guides, and directs us. It begins with you. Scripture doesn't necessarily give us the how-tos, although we find as you lie down, as you rise, as you walk along the way, but some of the how-tos of, of how you express the love of God is really kind of wide open. And it's a matter of exhortation of the need for us to grow and to develop and to model in order that we can leave a legacy. And so, it begins with you. It begins with me. It begins with our desire to say, we love you. And not just verbally, but our actions hold true to our words. And we express that love to every person. Well, the second thought is this. A D6 church creates a partnership. A partnership. 
Look back as you see in verses uh, 6 and 7. He again emphasizes the singular, the you. Verse 6, these words which I am commanding uh, you today shall be on your heart. And you shall teach them diligently to your sons and talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. And so at that moment, he shifts after he has said, okay, as we cross over and God is going to fulfill the promises that he has made to us as we look forward to what is ahead for us, you love God with everything you've got and then you impress upon them. And so again, you cannot give what you do not have. And so Moses says, what is in you flows out of you. And that is what you impress upon your children, your grandchildren, and the next generation. A D6 church seeks to create and increase the partnership with families and then collaborate on how we lead them to fall deeper in love with Jesus. I want to give you a phrase this morning and I want to encourage you to kind of put this in your memory bank, a, a phrase, two words that, that you will hear most often from me, and that is domestic church, domestic church. The domestic church is your home. I believe the Great Commission begins in the home and is lived through the home. And when we work to align Bacon Heights with every domestic church represented in our congregation, we transform generational discipleship. Outsourcing the spiritual development of children to the local church is not the answer to reaching the next generation. It's proven in Barna's research. We've done that for too many years. We've allowed parents to outsource their spiritual responsibilities to the local church. And friends, the mandate that Moses gives is that it is the domestic church's role to invest in the next generation and you represent one of those domestic churches. And on Sunday morning, all across this community, domestic churches come together as the local church known as Bacon Heights Baptist Church. My domestic church is 5620 100th Street. And that is the church that God has planted me in so that Hallie and Chloe and my wife and me can grow and develop in our love of Jesus Christ. But we need, hear me, we need a partnership with the local church. That's how God created it to work. That the family would partner with the local church. The domestic church in Bacon Heights together is a dangerous, dangerous thing. And it's special. And it's important. The church, the local church, was not meant to be a substitute for the family. It was meant to be a supplement. For the family. And so there's a shift in mindset that we have to take. There's a shift in priority that we have to understand that our job is a grace driven desire to push and press into the next generation. But once you love God with everything you are, then you're not only impressing upon them you're pressing into him you're pressing into jesus your relationship changes your family changes and god moves and the walls shake and the spirit transforms lives it's a partnership Tim Kimmel, who has done a lot of research and writing in areas of family ministry, he says these words, he says, The assumption that a child or teenager coming to church today 
would be inclined to believe the gospel story as it is typically presented is the new naivety. We would be naive to simply think that someone coming to church and church alone on a Sunday morning We would be naive to think that's simply going to be all there is to knowing Jesus Christ. You see, your domestic church is very important. And what you do during the week at your domestic church, friends, it matters. It matters. That time of study, personally and as a family. That time of worship, personally and as a family. That time of breaking bread, personally and as a family. Is critical to the longevity of Bacon Heights. And the investment that we have in the local community of Lubbock and beyond. Strong churches. Do not make strong families. Strong families make strong churches. Do you see why the family is so important? Do you see why Moses says it starts with you and then you create a partnership that is dynamic and will blow the doors off of everything you come in contact with when it is domestic church partnered with the local church. And that is who we want to be. Friends, the goal is not to raise your kids in church. The goal is to raise your kids in Christ. And we have to think along those lines. The crisis of our day in 2015 is not a terrorist organization. The crisis of our day is the disintegration of Of the biblical family of God. That's our crisis. That's what we face. That's what we're up against. And if we continue to do the same things we've always done. We will continue to get the same results we've always gotten. And so we shift today. To become a D6 church. Here's the last thing. A D6 church. Leaves a legacy. It leaves a legacy. It is hard for me to fathom with the schedules that we have. It's hard for me to fathom the kind of biblical legacy that we're leaving. Spiritual formation is at the bottom of our list. Our list of to-dos. We're just lucky to get to church some Sundays. But the core of faith and the eternity, the eternal legacy, man, it's in the home. It's in the home. And I want you to stop for a moment and just do a self-examination, a self-inventory with all the things you have on your schedule and your calendar. How many hours are you spending your time investing in the spiritual formation of the next generation? If you do not have grandchildren or children, how are you spending your time investing in the spiritual orphans of Bacon Heights Baptist Church? Spiritual orphans that are not being raised in a Christian home, but they come here longing for someone, guess what, to mentor them in the faith of Jesus Christ and the truth of the gospel. How are you connected to them? How are you investing in them? As the next generation of believers. How are you going to help them cross over from the Jordan River to the promised land that God has for them? You've come here this morning. And you have blessed my heart by being here. And you have given up a minimum of one hour, possibly two, if you stay to attend a Bible study or you attended a Bible study before church. So one to two hours. Of your 168 hours in the week. 
What are you going to do with the other 166 or 167 hours that you have to invest in the next generation this week? Or is your calendar and your schedule so full of stuff that have nothing to do with the kingdom of God that we continue to do the same things we've always done and you continue to get the same results you've always gotten? You see, the, to leave a legacy, that means you have to shift. You have to think differently. You, you may have to, oh, this is going to hurt. Change. Can I tell you that's not a bad word? Aren't you glad Christ changed your life? We've put such a negative connotation on one of the most powerful words in Scripture. And that's to change, to transform, to be made new. That takes change. It's not always comfortable. It's not always easy. I don't always like it. But I'm grateful. Legacy for Bacon Heights begins today for us to lay a foundation for the next generation. It's a biblical process. It's a biblical understanding. Psalms 145, one generation will declare your works to the next. Psalm 78, we must tell future generations the praises of the Lord, even children not yet born. This is not Jason Ashley's idea of what a church is to be about. It is scripture's process of who we are as a local church filled with with domestic churches. We will tell the next generation the praiseworthy deeds of our God. In closing, Titus 2, 2 Timothy, call upon the local church to practice the practical principles of mentoring. It's all there. It's a matter of us applying those things and then doing them. And that's why it's critical for us as a faith family to be intentional in our endeavors to build relationships across the aisles and beyond the worship service hour you attend. The longevity of the future of domestic churches hinges upon our ability as Bacon Heights to leave the shore, to venture into deep waters, and to become an intergenerational family of believers that the unchurched love to be a part of. Let's pray together. Father, this morning, it is a privilege as my domestic church joins with this local church, a body of believers, and says, will you equip us? Will you help us? Will you teach us how to model and how to encourage and how to nurture and train and reach next generation Father Bacon Heights says with a strong voice this morning we will tell the next generation the praiseworthy deeds of our God, our Yahweh our one mighty Lord Father I pray for those in this room this morning who have never come to to realize that they need you as their God in a personal, intimate way. And so I know that you are about the business of transforming the lives of people. And so across this room, if 
that person, would you speak very loudly and very clearly to their their mind and to their heart that you are drawing them to yourself? Today is the day of salvation for them. That they would come to experience the love of God with the totality of their being. I pray for my friends in this room this morning who maybe have experienced loss or struggle or brokenness this week. I pray today they would find comfort and peace by being in your presence, by being with your people. We come to a time of response as you continue to pray for a moment. Maybe you're here this morning and you're wondering what God has for you, your life, your family. Can I tell you, Bacon Heights would love to partner with you. We want to be a supplement to your domestic church. And so maybe today God is drawing your family, you as an individual, to come and join this body of believers. I'm going to ask Truman and Jim, part of our leadership team, they're going to be here this morning to receive you. We're going to stand and sing a hymn of invitation. If there's a response that you want to make, we ask you to do that today. Will you stand? Will you join Nick? You come. Jim will be here. Truman's here.